We don't have Blockbuster anymore, so I feel your pain. It's harder and harder to find low-budget horror these days, and that's what Low Budget Binge is all about. Let's start binging. Welcome back to M.L. Miller Frights. I'm M.L. Miller. Before we begin, please do me a favor and punch that like button down below. Share this video with all of your social media addicted pals. Click subscribe to this channel and ring that bell for notifications. Low Budget Binge is where we venture down the path less traveled and look at low budget, no budget, and sometimes international films that never get that top billing you see with the usual Hollywood fare. I'll indicate in the review down below where you can find these films along with their trailers. Here we go. Aliens Uncovered, The Golden Record, is a documentary new on digital download from Breaking Glass Films. It's directed and written by Clive Christopher. I've seen a million UFO documentaries, but Aliens Uncovered, The Golden Record, is one of the better ones. Most of these films share clips, stories, and accounts of UFO experiences through the years, but very few try to establish some kind of timeline and connection between some of these events. That's what Clive Christopher does in this, the third of his Aliens Uncovered documentary series, and the results are quite compelling. Christopher builds a very convincing bridge between these major UFO events, beginning with the decision by the government to place a golden record onto the two Voyager space probes that were launched in the 1970s. This was a project led by former CIA chief George Bush, and under his watch, a pair of golden records containing basic information about human life, our history, and our culture was shipped out into the cosmos attached to the Voyagers. After documenting the path of these probes, Christopher raises the question that the rise in UFO phenomena maybe comes from the information actually making it to another civilization and advanced civilizations attempting to communicate back with us in the form of these sightings. It's an interesting story, one that only becomes more interesting in the way Christopher threads some of the bigger UFO events together. Christopher goes deeply into the Lake Michigan incident, where a grouping of lights were witnessed by hundreds of people ranging from Michigan to Chicago. I hadn't seen this footage or phone conversations between radar control personnel, police, radio stations, and regular civilians calling 911 that occurred during the incident. But it seems to have been a whopper of a show. Not long after that, the Heaven's Gate cult committed suicide as the Hale-Bob comet passed by the Earth in hopes to transcend into the cosmos and live with aliens. And not long after that, the Phoenix Lights occurred. The way Christopher lays these series of events out is downright eerie in that it begins to tell a story that might indicate some kind of connection between these seemingly random events. It's a little bit of a leap, but still a fascinating one. Aliens Uncovered, The Golden Record, ends with the promise of another documentary soon furthering the connections. While I remain skeptical about some of the connections this documentary made, it does lay out the argument in a clear and interesting way. I haven't seen a documentary attempt to draw a cohesive line between these events, and while it might be bunk, as more info is being released and sightings have been occurring at a greater frequency, what used to be the subject of crackpots and loons now seems to be something we all should pay close attention to. I can't wait to look back on the previous two Aliens Uncovered films, which happen to be on Tubi right now. And I'm looking forward to the next documentary continuing this fascinating look at some very strange connections between UFO phenomena. The Nightgown is new streaming on Amazon and on DVD from Frolic Pictures. It's directed and written by Jared Masters. Filmmaker Jared Masters returns with another low-budget offering set in 1979 about three young gals, played by Kate Lai Johnston, Baraka, and Elizabeth Rath, taking a trip to a cabin in the woods that is tormented by a botched exorcism, a possessed girl, and a haunted nightgown. Nightgown is another one of Jared Masters' art house horror films. This means that there really is not a lot of logic going on here. Once weird things begin, the lead gals react to them, but then the next scene happens and it seems like nothing weird has happened at all. This sort of nightmare dream logic can be infuriating for literal thinkers, but for those who sort of live in the moment and can enjoy a good, solid, weird sequence of events, The Nightgown is for you. The Nightgown has some potentially scary scenes depicting the abuse and exorcism of a young girl. There's a gnarly scene with a screeching demon nun, 
and a ghost with an axe that is downright haunting. Masters does a good job of framing these monstrosities and milking them for all the scares he can muster. But it's some of the dream logic sequences, such as the scene with a little kid playing marbles who can't stop saying, Eat my mushy! that will stick with me for a long time. The Nightgown is Master's most expansive film to date. Sure, the acting has its ups and downs, but you get some pretty nightmarish sequences if you take a chance with this one. Again, just preparing you if you do, this is lo-fi art house horror, so big time Hollywood fans might want to pass this up. But if you prefer scares that are somewhat ethereal, The Nightgown is the haunted garment movie for you. Dr. Seville's Horror Show is streaming on Amazon Prime and digital download. It's directed by Kevin R. Phillips and written by Craig W. Chenery, Kevin R. Phillips, Kirk Levinger, and Alan Valor. Dr. Seville's Horror Show starts out with a man talking to his wife in a bar on the phone, and he's distracted by another woman sitting at the bar across from him. The woman buys a guy a drink, and we cut to him later waking up strapped into a dentist chair with a mad doctor type named Dr. Seville, while the man is obviously wondering what the hell is going on, Dr. Seville tortures him and shows him short films on the screen in front of him, and thus another horror anthology begins. Consume is a short story, urban legend, that I have seen play out before as a woman who wants to lose weight for her wedding decides to take a pill with a tapeworm in it prescribed by her doctor. Of course, there's no such thing as a quick fix, and the promised effect seems to have disastrous side effects. It's a morality tale, as much of these short stories tend to be, and though it isn't the most original, I will say the acting is sharp and the effects are quite good and squirmy. Next is It's Complicated, about a man who has difficulty finding the right girl. He not only immediately finds something wrong with his dates, but he hates conflict and avoids breaking up with them, preferring simply to ghost them. The guy receives a gift called an Aqua Buddy, which turns out to be a human-sized sea monkey-like being who at first seems to be the perfect mate, but the cracks in the facade begin to show pretty quickly, and this mate is difficult to avoid or break up with. I like this one quite a bit as it takes some jarring turns and sticks its landing pretty strongly. Break is the third and final tale in this collection. It starts out as your typical zombie apocalypse story as a father and daughter struggle to survive with the undead occasionally showing up at their doorstep and the father beating them down with a hammer. They struggle to maintain food and other necessities, and everything seems to be quite cliched until it doesn't. This is another well-paced, strongly acted, and decently realized little tale. Not only is it suspenseful, but the final moments are surprisingly tragic. I found the connective tissue between the stories with the actual Dr. Seville and his tortured victim to be kind of uninspired, but the stories within are strong. This is the case for most anthologies, so don't let the hammy wraparound deter you from checking out Dr. Seville's Horror Show. It's a trio of strong tales of terror with a lot of talent in front of and behind the camera. And we've got another anthology for you in High Fear. It's new on demand and digital download from Wild Eye Releasing. It's directed and written by Todd Sheets, Tim Ritter, Anthony Catanese, Brad Sykes, and Josephina Sykes. High Fear is what looks to be the third in a series of anthology films with High Death and High Eight preceding it. This one has four tales from low-budget directors you might know and some you might want to get to know. In the first segment, Losing It at the Devil's Whorehouse, a trio of kids show up at a high-end brothel looking to get their virgin friend laid. I thought it was going to be another vampire brothel story and prepared for the cliches, but the twist and do-it-yourself practical effects actually made this one a lot of fun. This one has boobs and blood aplenty, and while it might not really be top tier, it delivers schlock capably and death scenes that are pretty inventive. This one is from Todd Sheets, who's also participated in High Death and High Eight, as well as directing and writing Dreaming in Purple Neon, Clown Nato, and the Kansas City Blender Massacre. Who could forget that? Meth Heads, a cheating wife, a murderous pastor, Rattlesnakes and an inbred hillbilly family having fun whipping each other with a rope of intestines pretty much sums up the depraved yet narratively complex When Shadows Come Alive from iconic indie horror director Tim Ritter, who worked on High Death and High Eight, as well as Sharks of the Corn, Cat Nado, and the classic Truth or Dare series. Filmed in a grindhouse format, 
Ritter delivers a story that feels like some of the stuff dealt with in the Truth or Dare series, but with a modern hillbilly meth head family twist. This pretty standard stalk and slasher has some very grody effects and of course a lot of boobs. Coming in third is, I think my favorite of the bunch, The Streets Are Watching. It's a solid segment about a homeless girl and her homeless cronies who share the streets with a crazy person named Crazy Killer Carl, or KKK. Carl is fighting his own demons, and they may be more real than they all think. This was the shortest of the group, but definitely the most resonant. It depicts the homeless population pretty fairly, as well as how they look at themselves and how society views them. But the hallucination sequences with Carl's demon are truly impressive, as they are used smartly in quick cuts. Director, writer Anthony Cadenese also did the lo-fi schlocker Sodomaniac and the upcoming Caddy Hack, which is a spoof of Caddyshack, with mutant killer groundhogs attacking a golf course. After seeing what he did with this segment, I'm actually looking forward to seeing Caddy Hack when it comes out next month. Day Out of Days is the fourth and final installment from High Death, High 8 director Brad Sykes and writer Josephine Sykes. Sykes also did Plaguers and the early installments of the Camp Blood series. Here the story focuses on a pair of young lovers who show up for a photo shoot at a cabin in the woods and only one other member of the crew shows up with them. Meanwhile the temperature is abnormally hot, these days are getting longer, and they're seeing bright lights in the woods. What's going on? The Sykes keep the answers under wraps for a long time, but it makes for some nice, suspenseful moments as tensions between the three rise and the weird stuff intensifies. This one could have been a full-length feature, the acting is better than average, and the odd stuff happening feels pretty unique. It's a good segment. The wraparound is weak. It's about an artist who is hired to make a comic book about your greatest fears, and she only has one afternoon to do it. Anyone who has even cracked open a comic book knows that... That's just not how comics work. Still, it just serves as a means to set up the stories, so I guess it does its job. High Fear delivered a pair of decent low-tier tales and another pair that really impressed me. If you're a fan of anthologies, you might want to seek this one out as it highlights some very cool talent in the low-budget horror biz. Jethika is new streaming on Screenbox. It's directed by Peter Oz and written by Andy Faulkner, Callie Hernandez, Ashley Denise Robinson, and Pete O's. School friends, Elena, played by Callie Hernandez, and Jessica, played by Ashley Denise Robinson, have a chance meeting at a gas station where Jessica reveals that she is fleeing a former boyfriend, Kevin, played by Will Madden, who refuses to accept their breakup. Elena invites Jessica to her mobile home in the middle of the desert to lay low, but soon they begin hearing someone screaming, Jessica, outside. Turns out it's Kevin, But not only is there something very odd with the way the stalker boyfriend pronounces Jessica, but there is something quite off with Kevin himself as well. Jethica is a quirky drama with supernatural elements. It's not a straight-up horror movie, but it does include some bits and pieces dealt with in the horror genre. For the most part, it's about the ending of a relationship, obsession, avoiding conflict, and the acceptance of the truth. While the film could make Kevin out to be a character easy to despise, I was surprised how sympathetic this character is. He's presented in a pitiful light, so much so that one can't help but feel a bit for his plight once you understand the entire story. At the same time, while Jessica is the titular character, there's a lack of focus on Jessica herself. Most of the scenes feature Callie Hernandez's Elena character and how she's trying to help Jessica, trying to bring this relationship with Kevin to its ultimate conclusion. Jessica spends most of the time hiding from Kevin, while it's Elena who is the one actively trying to solve the problem. What makes Jethika so effective is the conflicting messages it gives. Kevin is a stalker, there's no doubt about that. He won't leave Jessica alone, and some of the things he says are quite scary and disturbing. But we're only told Jessica's side of the story, which casts him as the stalker boyfriend. You never really see what that relationship is like. If anything, the way Jessica hides from the conflict She's not really presented as a viable protagonist, and because we all know stalking is bad, we're supposed to side with her blindly. But since Kevin is given all of the lines, decrying his love for Jessica, and presenting his arguments to a panel of jurors that do not exist in a rambling, yet sympathetic way, I found myself strangely rooting for Kevin to find happiness. This conundrum is not an easy feeling to sit with, and that's why Jethika is such a strange little mindfuck of a film. 
Elena, who is characterized as a damaged, apathetic soul, isn't that likable either. So in the end, all you have is the pale, sad sack babbling in the yard who is Kevin to feel for. This works because Will Madden does one hell of a great job as Kevin. Playing believably manic is no easy feat, but man does Madden do a great job of it. You'll loathe him one second for what he says, then tear up for how brutally honest he is with his feelings the next. That's powerful acting. While it's not necessarily scary, Jethika is often funny, yet powerful little movie dealing with raw emotions and real-life tragedies in a supernatural way. It's a short and sweet little film that doesn't overstay its welcome and speaks volumes about how we are often haunted by relationships and how some end without some logical explanation. Just a cold, hard fact that the end is inevitable one way or another. Finally, there's Hole in the Fence. It's new on demand in digital download from Altered Innocence. It's directed by Joaquin Del Paso and written by Joaquin Del Paso and Lucy Pollack. A religious summer camp for privileged youth begins with excited boys looking forward to fun and adventure. The staff works hard to teach the boys discipline, honor, and pride, encouraging them to work together through performances, daily prayer, and games. But boys will be boys, and while the main goal of the camp is to help out the local villagers, it turns out to be a matter of survival of the fittest, where those who are different are secluded and tormented right under the noses of the pious counselors. Tensions escalate between different fractions of the camp and rise to a fever pitch during a game of capture the flag taken all too seriously. While it's not as controversial, The Hole in the Fence is as much a horror film as Larry Clark's 1995 film Kids. Now, it's not as taboo-breaking as Kids was, but it does focus on the very disturbing interactions between kids, interactions that are very different than what are usually depicted in media today. The horror comes from the cruel way the kids treat one another and the dangers they face even at a seemingly harmless place as a religious summer camp. While things do get very Lord of the Flies-like towards the end, the adult counselors are present and provide their own set of threats towards these impressionable children. The climax where the kids go wild and start attacking one another serves as a result of what the counselors have taught them in their lessons. This behavior is encouraged by those they look up to which seems to be the main point of The Hole in the Fence. That corruption, prejudice, homophobia, abuse, violence, and other terrible traits are a result of the leaders of this societal structure these kids find themselves being in. The camp is for privileged children, but also seems to open their doors to those who aren't as fortunate. This causes a wedge in the group as well. This is clearly shown by following one child whose skin is darker than the others, who desperately tries to conform, but is singled out time and time again. And being singled out is the worst thing you can do at this camp, as it leaves you vulnerable to gang violence from the rest of the kids, as well as making him the prime target for some of the predators that make up the adults of the camp. Through some very subtle dialogue, we find out that all kinds of abuse and wrongdoings have occurred in the past, and it's seen as a rite of passage for most involved, as well as a case of survival of the fittest for the weak. Thematically, there's a lot going on in The Hole in the Fence, the camp is an allegory for what's wrong with the world outside of it. When one of the rich kids is hurt, his parents take a helicopter in and whisk him away. But the parents who have gone through the camp before seem to look back on it with fond memories, as if the horrifying lesson learned at the camp has helped shape the future of so many people in the upper crust and suggesting how corrupt that class level can be. These teachings have been going on for generations, and as the kids settle back into their own lives towards the end, it seems the camp will live on to serve future generations with the same warped views. It's the same kind of class commentary that you found at the end of Infinity Pool. This is where the true horror in The Hole in the Fence lies. Don't go into this Mexican film thinking it's going to be something like Them or Eden Lake or even Children of the Damned. The Hole in the Fence is a very dark drama shining a spotlight on institutional failures in what we teach our children. It focuses on very uncomfortable issues and is not for those easily triggered. But the film does a fantastic job of trying to teach the audience about what children are taught when the parents are not around and how that can shape them into true monsters under the wrong influence. Have you seen any of these indies? If not, let me know which ones look interesting to you down in the comments section. Stuck in
outside your reality. Yeah.